uh, an audience member that's going to um, that I'm going to call into action. Um, I know a lot of um, uh, people have been listening to teachers that are on strike in Minneapolis and um, challenges with our teachers in Rochester too. We hear stories about what it's like for teachers these days. Um, and um, among my age group, which is very different from the age group of, well, except for a few of you. <laughs> um, this is a lot of complaining about kids these days. And you remember, what's the matter with kids these days? I, and why can't they be like we were, perfect in every way? Um, so not a new, not a new subject, but um, it does, it does seem like kids are in a tougher situation now than they were when we were in high school. I never saw a police officer. I mean, I went to Mayo High School. I never saw a police officer. And if there was a fight, it was two girls kind of pawing at each other or, or some, you know, chest bumping among the guys. But there was a, some smoke odor in the hallway sometimes, but that was about the extent of it. Um, and certainly kids have a, a, a lot more um, threats and, and serious challenges than we did. So why is that? I don't know. Um, I read a, uh, a note from a teacher who was leaving e uh, education, and she wasn't leaving to take care of her family. She wasn't leaving to get a better job. She was leaving because she was so exhausted, because she didn't have the support of the parents, because she couldn't afford all the school supplies for all of her kids, because kids didn't pay attention. She blamed parent involvement, she blamed technology, and she blamed the school system to a degree. And it was heartbreaking to read, but it does make me wonder how are things in Rochester Public Schools. So we have um, some representatives, some teachers from Rochester Public Schools to talk about what it's like in Rochester Public Schools. Is it terrible? Um, we know some bad things have happened in schools in the last <laughs> couple weeks. Um, so we've got um, Tiffany Erie, who is at Franklin. I'm hoping that I can convince Andy Johnson to speak about what it's like at Mayo High School. And then lo and behold, we have a Mayo High School student here who can give a little bit of perspective too. I personally think that kids these days are fantastic because the only kids I know are. And um, they use a lot of technology and they know how to interact with people too. And they do interact with people. So I'm a lot less worried than a lot of people are. So Tiffany, what do you say? What do you say about what it's like these days? Um, so this is my 15th year of teaching. Um, and it's very, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same as how it started. Um, sorry, my voice is a little funny. I lost my voice. Um, I don't, I don't, it's, it's different and it's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, I, so I teach art. So I have all the kids. I have K through five. And um, the kids coming back from the pandemic, you know, our, our kindergartners have very little skills to work with. So we're kind of starting way, way, way backwards. Um, and then the, the social anxiety I'm seeing in our in a lot of the kids is so hard. So we have the curriculum, we have all the political stuff, we have all of the all of this stuff happening in the world and the kids are feeling it. Um, it's coming out in their art. I see it in their art on a regular basis. And I encourage that because I want them to have a safe space to, to get that out. Um, but like teaching during the pandemic, you know, we now we were teaching to the parents too and we were trying to also entertain the parents and having i received many emails about what i was teaching and how i was teaching it and it wasn't right and um i should try something else and all i wanted to do was to be with students and then become a teacher to sit behind the screen and become a teacher to be at home I became a teacher to be with the kids and to then uh, be put in my home and 
behind a screen where in appearance were trying their best. I know they were, um, but art was you know at the bottom of their list. They wanted them to do the other stuff. So then I would sit there just so hopeful and praying that they would show up so I could see their faces and hear how they're doing because um, I work so hard to make sure my our studio space is a space that where kids feel welcome and safe and I'm that adult for them too. So to then send them out and not know if they're safe and um, if they're if they're black kids, well, what are they what are they thinking, you know, during all of that stuff and are they feeling safe and just oh so much stuff, so many things. Um, it's it's hard. There's a lot of there's a lot of division um, among teachers, I feel like, and the kids, and then they're bringing in what they hear the parents talking about at home. So that's it's hard. there's just so much, and it is definitely hard. It's not it's not <laughs> what it used to be for sure. So I have a friend that teaches second grade at Rivers, not not at Riverside. She's at uh, what Pinewood. And um, when her, this second grade class was the hardest class she's had in 20, 30 years of teaching. And she attributed that to the fact that these kids had never been in school and they didn't know how to do school. There hadn't been preschool, there hadn't been kindergarten, there hadn't been first grade. Um, not all kids get to go to preschool. So that's part of it. But, but um, how do you deal with kids? that are now second graders that don't know how to do school? Um, I'm just going way, and I'm not, I'm trying to build in math and reading and all of those things into my space because I know they're, they're missing out on so much. So I'm pulling pieces of those in and the classroom teachers are just in a, a way different spot than I am. Um, they're, they're missing a lot of their fine motor skills for sure, their social skills. So making sure we are practicing those when we share our art, you know, how do you, how do you be patient? How do you wait for that person to speak? You know, those little things. Um, how do you give uh, feedback to somebody and be kind about it? <laughs> you know, use kind words. How do you accept somebody else's idea that maybe you have a different idea about? Um, so you know, I'm still teaching art, but I'm very, very aware that I need to be pulling in way, way more. Um, and we're, you know, we're writing our artist statements about our art, and the, the writing is very behind, so I have to build in um, pieces for that to help support their writing. Yeah. Um, we have a granddaughter, and first hats off to you because all I hear about is art. Matter of fact, just this last weekend, <laughs> I had to go buy her another art book. <laughs> and she's out drawing. As a matter of fact, in church today, she's the one doodling right next to me. Yeah, I was watching her the whole time. <laughs> so you don't feel it. But on a side note, uh, she also likes math, and she periodically will shoot at grandpa's house. Uh, I have no art, art talent. My wife has been blessed with that. I'm the, the engineer, the math science guy. Um, so she'll quiz me on math. We have a little flash that we use once in a while. So whatever you guys are doing, um, you're doing something right. The last two years have been tough on everybody, so hats off to you. You've really done a good Thank job. You. You're doing the best you can. Can I add on one thing? <laughs> so many, many years ago, I took ninth grade art as a, my first elective for high school here in Rochester. And the art teacher we had at the time, he, I still look outside and I look at sunset, sunrise, I see things in nature. And I still remember things he taught us in, in art class. So you have an effect on kids. Yeah. Thank you. And I feel I, I should not be, I, I wish we had a classroom teacher here because their whole experience is so different than mine. Um, and the, you know, they have the standardized testing they're trying to live up to. Um, the, 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 the parents are, much harder on them. A lot of them could care less that their kids have art and that there's an art teacher until the subject I bring up is not something they approve of. Um, so I, I wish that they were here to to speak to, and my sister is a fifth grade teacher at Riverside, so I do see her side. You know, the kids were at home and she's trying to reach them, and then the kids were in school and she's trying to reach them. And 
the, the balancing and organizing of all of that stuff is, is, it is not to be dramatic, but it is killing them. It is, there are so many teachers, young teachers that, you know, my age who are read just want something else because this is not what they signed up for. It's hard. Go ahead, you go ahead. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andy Johnsard. Um And the first thing that I would say is I'm not here to, uh, to share anything other than my personal experience. I'm not here to speak for the district. I'm not here to speak for any school district. Um, and I, I think that, um, well, I think a lot of things, that doesn't make them true, but um, as a classroom teacher, this is my 24th year. I started teaching in 1998. And um, yeah, I would echo a lot of what, what Tiffany was saying is, uh, uh, this is this is not uh, the game that, that we signed up for. Um, and, and, and I think that, um, I think those 24 years, um, being the son of an educator, um, the son-in-law of an educator, the grandson of an educator, um, I, I don't know, I don't think we know what we want public school to be uh, right now. Um, and I think that can be an opportunity. And I think that, as Tiffany was just saying again, I think that can also be an incredibly taxing position to be in, um, where um, public schools, uh, we all have opinions about them, um, for better and for worse. Uh, the politicization of, of um, pretty much every aspect of, of what we do, the microscope, uh, you know, bills uh, being introduced and passed where you know, people can directly report and give direct feedback. What I know um, uh, is that public schools are a mirror, and they show us exactly who we are. Uh, they show us exactly what we value. Um, and uh, I'm 49 years old, and I don't like to look in the mirror at 49 and still see blemishes and see sagging, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the realities of aging. But again, public schools are a mirror. Um, and it, it can be uncomfortable to look at what we are. Um, I will, I, I, I will say that um, on top of, of everything that's going on, um, and maybe this is heretical for a, a public school teacher to say, but um, no human being was ever put on this planet to do school. No human being was uh, was ever was ever meant to be a student. Um, they're human beings, um, so that's that's one thought. Um, I will tell you that as a high school teacher, um, this uh, is uh, again, you know, can be an opportunity. I would say that the opportunity here is incredibly limited, um, it, incredibly limited. Um, I, I walk into a classroom uh, where uh, I kid you not, I count. Um, on a daily basis as class starts, what percentage of those kids um, are staring into the void. That's what I've, I've come to, to look at it as. Um, and it is a void. Uh, and it, it, on top of everything, that as Tiffany and as, as we've all lived, um, uh, that, is not, <laughs> that is not a good idea. Um, I've heard comedians joke that uh, it's become the new, the new smoking. Well, now, using you know that metaphor or analogy, we now have kids smoking all day long. Um, you know, I mean, think about it. you know you're old enough in this room, right? We're old enough in this room, um, with how commonplace it was. Um, and what does anybody do? You know, when they have a moment, they look into the void. Um, and uh, so, so, what have we done? We're a mirror, right? We're a mirror of society. So, uh, so we put those in the hands of everybody. Um, saying, you know, saying such, you know, such things as well. You know, it's a part of life now. It is, um, but it is a is it a part of life that uh, that that's helping or hurting? Um, and I think on top of everything else, it's hurting. Um, yeah, there are some thoughts. I, I came to listen this morning. I, I wasn't going to talk to y'all. So um, again, I'm not here as a representative of any large Southeast Minnesota school district. <laughs> yes? What kind of supports are the teachers receiving from, you know, from the district? Is there anything for them for self-care or for some care? So, I, 
guess I can speak to Franklin. Um, well, our superintendent has built in some days for us to uh, get stuff done and meet with each other. And I know like classroom teachers are calling a lot of parents and you know taking care of stuff they can't get done in, in the regular school day. Um, at Franklin, I know our administrators are working very hard to find ways. We have three administrators, and they're trying, like, giving teachers breaks so teachers can just go out and, you know, maybe they leave an hour early, or um, maybe they just have an hour to just go sit in the break room and just be for a little bit because um, there's we we don't have subs. We're really short on subs, and so if I'm gone, if our teacher's gone, that's the prep for the classroom teacher. That's their time to get stuff done. But if I'm gone, they don't get that time when it's their art day. So they're not, other than the recess and um, uh, lunch, they're not getting a break from their children. We love our children, we love them, but you need, I mean, we're, we, you need time. You need time to prep the materials, to make copies, to breathe. <laughs> um, and so I know administ administrators are burnt out too. They're, real, they're trying to wear the smiles for everybody. and. So at Franklin, at least I know that they're trying um, their best to, to find ways to help us. Um, and then those, some of those off days, that I know at a few of the schools, um, the principals have set up some like um, well-being kind of activities so the staff can be together. Because we haven't been in staff meetings together. We've only been on a screen. So you know we, we don't even have time together. Um, so they have just like fun days together where you can kind of build that community again among your staff. So they're trying, trying their best with the time and money that we have. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. Um, just uh, how much um, administrators are in the same boat, obviously, and, and we're all, we're all doing what we can. Um, I, you know, a lot of times when I think about school, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned, the idea of the mirror and, um, you know, what is the mirror? Uh, you know, what, what, what is it that. Um, <laughs> that's reflected back. I, I read something years ago about raising kids and you know we swim in this in this culture that says more fast, easy, fun. Um, and, and so as Tiffany was, was sharing about those those rest days from um, Dr. Cal, um, I, I think are, are a great offering. I, I think they're a great gesture. Um, I think they're a great um, you know pressure valve um, to release. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of us, myself included, is okay. So I've got a moment to breathe. I've, I've got time to breathe. Well, I better fill that with something because the wave is so big, right? The the wave of what's coming is is so big. Um, uh, expectations and um, you know uh, what we want to do, what we what we want uh, to help change. And I think someplace in there, there's a disconnect. Um, from from the reality of um, what we are capable of doing as an institution, and that's something you're not supposed to talk about. You know, you're you're not supposed to you're not supposed to acknowledge the elephants plural in the room, um, and, and and that's that's a weird situation to be in, um, and and I think that part of that is is built into the service nature of of what we do, um, and what teaching is. Um, and, and I don't think we've done a very good job, uh, and I don't have the answer, but I don't think we've done a very good job, uh, because I think that you know, when, when the next elephant uh, you know, becomes the topic of the day, we say, yep, yeah, we'll fix that, yeah, we'll do that, yeah, we got it, we got it. Well, we're starting under-resourced. We're starting, again, as a mirror, right? Where are our resources? Um, and and I, I don't think, um, <laughs> I think that reality is a really, really tough one, and I think that's you know that's the, the touch point, and I think that's the grind, um, where it's it's really tough. How do I how do I open my heart? How do I uh, you know how do I hold space uh, for those kids in the reality that they're in, and give them whatever I can so that when they leave school. Right? Again, we're not made to do school. When they leave school, how can they step up and be a decent human being? Uh, you know, I think knowing stuff is, is great. I think knowing stuff is, is really important. And I think knowing um, you know, how to figure things out is, is what we're all about. But how do, how do we prepare these kids for, um, for the real world?
out there. Yeah. I don't think that was really a cogent thought, but that's okay. Uh, and and uh, as being a mirror, I think um, if you're seeing bad behavior, you have to look at adults and see, well, uh, how are adults behaving right now? That was a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, a couple questions. One, I'll come back to you, Jennifer. <clears throat> you commented on the students speaking to you through the nature of their art. I'd be curious in your thoughts or comments on what are they telling you? What does the art show? The other one, a question to both of you, is the state is awash in money at the moment. I'm not close to the school system, although I have a daughter who couldn't take it anymore and is off on another job. Um, any coordinated, focused effort from the school system, the parents, or anybody to attempt to get those resources applied to the children and the schools to address the issues that you're bringing forward today? I like that Tiffany and I both look to each other like, huh. <laughs> and we're going to give Megan a chance to speak. Well, I'll speak about the art. Um, there, um, well, for instance, I just had a fifth grader do this um, terrifying artwork um, of herself in the middle, and it was about social anxiety and all of the things being said around her and how she feels, and it's pencil, and it's, it's a lot of rubbing, it's dark, and it's sad, it's so sad, and, but she was so proud because she put, she put all of that that was in here onto the paper. Um, there's a lot of violence, a lot of violence, and that's coming from video games. It's always video games. Um, there's um, a lot about racism. If their feelings about that, they're seeing their friends hurt. Um, they're hearing about it too. Um, and then same with um, like transgender and all of our students who are feeling stuck. There, there's kids who are kind of putting that into their art for their friends. It's usually for their friends because right? they're hearing their friends struggle and they're doing something in their art with the colors or the images that they put into it. Um, so it's mostly the older kids who are, who are putting these things in. The younger kids, it's the video games and the knives and the guns and the shooting and, um, you know, we get it all and then, okay, no, this is not going to go on display because this is not appropriate, and then, I, you know, at least they got it out. <laughs> we got it out of there. Now, what can we move on to and do next? Because they got to get it out. I mean, they're seeing it. It's their world every day, all the time. That's what they go home and do. Um, so let them get it out, and then, and then we move on. Um, that's that's a, a lot of it. Most of the art. I'll let you speak to the other question. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Um, uh, to your second question, uh, I, <laughs> I, I honestly have no ideas. I think the latest estimate that I heard was nine billion or something like that. The, it had actually gone up, um, and the uh, the cynical part of me, the majority part of me, um, uh, at this point uh, uh, says, uh, you know, what great news? What you know, ten-ish years ago that we, we as a state could come up with half a billion dollars so that the billionaire wills could have a place for their millionaire players to play um, in you know US Bank Stadium. Uh, and so I don't know, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't understand um, you know, that uh, how, how we can have the will, you know, because the, the big argument was, you know, oh my gosh, we're gonna lose the Vikings. Um, you know, and, and it, it, it's a false equivalency. I mean, it's not the same thing. I, I, I get that. Um, and yet, it is our money. Um, it, it is our resource. And um, I, I think that uh, just throwing money at a situation, I, I mean, to get to the political, the political aspect, I mean, I think we know probably, you know, stereotypically and traditionally, what are the arguments, right? You know, the, the liberals, all they want is your money, and the conservatives, you know, and say my money is mine and I should keep it. Um, and, and the criticism is true, right? That, that we will just keep asking for money <laughs> because it's really expensive to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and, and so there's, there's some truth there. 
Um, uh, I think that uh, I think there's there's a lot of people. Tiffany was talking about it before. There are, there are a lot of my colleagues, um, not uh, not just at Mayo High School, but across the district. That I um, again, I, I think I know things. But if if somebody walked through with a magic golden ticket and said, I'll pay you roughly the same and your family will be, you know, roughly whole. Um, uh, but here's, here's a different job uh, that's not in public education. I wonder what the percentage would be um, of people. I, I would take it. Um, I would step out tomorrow, um, which, uh, which isn't because I, I don't care for kids and, and I don't want the best for them. Um, it's just the, the question is sustainability. Right? Uh, uh, all these things that, that we think we're going to do and all these things that are put on us, right? Not, not by anybody's choice. Um, are we going to be able to do those things? And um, I would walk uh, if, if I had the, the choice. Well, can I just turn that question around? I think that's what are we doing? You know, who are we talking to about, about the issues? And I know one conversation I had was class size. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so it's class size. Another question, and then we'll hear from Megan. This is for both you and Andy and Tiffany. Do you feel safe? Two questions. Do you feel safe in your classroom? And do you feel the students are safe inside the building? Loaded question. We might also let um, Benjamin answer that question. Um, Uh, I guess I would say I I feel safe. There's definitely kids that I've looked at and I'm like, I'm backing way up because I don't know when you're gonna fall apart. Um, yeah, I don't, um, I have kids in the public school system too. And I know every day when my middle schooler leaves, I pray, please keep him safe at school. Um, because I just, you just don't know. <laughs> You don't know what what they might encounter what kid is having a really bad day um, yeah um, well for me in school I feel safe but it really depends on the people that you're around like there are definitely some people that you for sure want to steer clear from or else I mean like it's just an empty situation and uh, with everything going on right now, it's always like extremely tense, and I've had moments where my teacher has like spent 30 minutes talking to the class about emails that he's getting from parents. Like, why isn't this in the grade book when he has no clue what's going on and it's all tech issues? And um, yeah, the it's just kind of like a lot going on right now, and I feel like the dust still kind of needs to settle a little bit more before things really catch traction and we get back to the way that things work. Do you think it is safe? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, for the most part. I mean, it's it's not like the school itself isn't safe, it's just some of the people in there are not. You know, like, I'm not saying that they're not safe at all, but some are safer than others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I have to be careful with, with this response, um, but there have been some newsworthy events um, that have I have connection to, um, and uh, that makes me concerned. Um, I have kids, I, I go to school with our 16-year-old Penelope, um, our 13-year-old Olive will join me next year, uh, and Ben at Mayo, um, and I have concerns. Um, I think there's, related to the political question, Right, um, it, it's really easy um, for us to see the other as some two-dimensional cutout rather than you know a full human being. Um, and I, I again, the mirror, right? Um, the the kids sense that. I um, my wife and I are posting a um, a German exchange student right now as well. And uh, in a moment of exasperation, I will not use the same language that I used when I expressed this to her. Um, but parents, kids, 
Um, uh, it, it seems like a lot of times I'm talked at like I work at Burger King, um, you know, rather than somebody with 24 years, 24 years of experience and a master's degree in education. Um, and, you know, maybe, just maybe something to offer. Um, uh, but just that being talked at, like Ben said, you know, with, uh, about emails, about work, and I mean, uh, another experience uh, that I just had last week, uh, and, and this I can share in a way that, that doesn't, uh, um, that isn't unprofessional or, or uh, betrays anonymity, but um, basically had an email from, uh, from a parent who, you know, said, my kid doesn't like this and is not doing well this way, so here's what you're gonna do and laid out, you know, I'm pulling my kid out and you're going to deliver education this way. And, and, <laughs> and, and I, started, I started to reply to my colleagues, not to the dad, and I just deleted it because it would, you know, it would not be worth, uh, it would not be worth saying. Um, but but there's, a, there's a disconnect, you know, they're, they're seeing the other, you know, uh, in all sorts of ways. That's, that's just this really flattened, um, you know, version of... Um, Absolutely, you know, we, we are e pluribus unum, right? And and I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, we're, we're just killing the pluribus, right? Just pluribus, pluribus, pluribus. You know, I, I'm a child of 1972, right? I'm, I've got a really special little self-esteem inside of me. But what about the unum, right? What about the unum where, where I do have to sacrifice, I do have to give, um, I do have to... Um, not always trust what I think about a, a given situation. Um, that's a thought. My name is Megan Beatty. I teach sixth grade over at John Adams Middle School. I've been a teacher for 14 years. I've taught in the Chicago Public Schools, and I've been eight years at John Adams. This is the hardest year I've ever taught. I will give you a little insight into the hallways and my classroom. I teach uh, English as a second language is primarily it, but I teach it within the walls of social studies and English language. And so I have half my students as Yale students and the other half coming from what you consider a normal American household. This year, about 60% of, of all students at John Adams are doing fantastic. They are really growing up resilient, they're kind, they're thoughtful, they are hardworking. And that's because, not necessarily of teachers, but their household that they come from. They come from a household of usually two parents, a household that sits down to have dinner together to ask how they're doing, a household that holds them accountable to their homework. And when a teacher calls, they answer and they take care of the issue at hand. About another 20% of my students I would consider to be fragile. They're barely holding on. They're holding it together, but it's not very well and about 10% of my students have completely fallen off the deep end. They are to the point where they're drowning and we don't have enough resources to get to them. The behavior and the language of that 10% of students that I'm going to speak to you about is pretty horrible. You ask the question, do I feel safe in school? I would echo Ben, it would depend on which child I'm hanging out with. <laughs> And at the moment of their attitude, I'm not a very big person, and I have gotten into the middle of a lot of fights this year. A lot of physical fights, where they are no longer thinking, they're simply reacting, and it is, you know, um, not using the cortex of their brain. So, no. You will ask my students, do some middle schoolers feel safe? No. They feel safe when they're in my classroom. I close the door, I'm able to handle it. But as soon as we get into the hallways, things are scary, we're tough, we're overcrowded. There's a lot of kids. There's a lot of high emotions. Um, social media does not help. They don't have the means to understand it. And when you and I were growing up, I was an 80s kid. Uh, when you and I were growing up, yeah, there were bullies, but you got to go home at the end of the night and close your door and talk about it and you were okay. Now social media bogs these kids down. Every moment they wake up, they look at that phone and they're reminded of the fight that they were in or why someone is angry with them or why someone was bullying them and what they're saying and it is repeated at an echo at them. And they don't have the coping skills. Again, this is that 10% that I'm talking about. The 60% that go home to two parents have a place and someone to talk to on how to handle it. But that 10% don't. And now when they come to school, they're coming to school already fired up. 
and they're already angry at so-and-so because they never got over it from the day before. So we have counselors. We've got three counselors. We have two wonderful um, social workers. We have three administrators, and it's not enough to reach 1,200 kids who really need their help. The other issue we're having with it is that after being online for two years, that 10% comes on, to, you know, online, and all you see is their icon. So it's just, it's, you know, a picture that they, they've picked. They're not actually presence. We're like, hey, so-and-so, you there? You there? You there? You know, and they're, they're not actually there. They're playing video games and doing something, and those were my fragile learners. So let's talk two years ago, they were in fourth grade. We'll take my sixth graders. Two years ago, they were in fourth grade. They were fragile. They were probably a year or two behind. They're probably working more at a second, third grade level, but we can try to catch them up. Well, two years go by that they didn't turn in any homework. No one was there to help them at home. We couldn't reach them online, through email, through phone calls, through administration, going to the house to try to help them get on. They weren't there. So two years goes by, no one's worked with them on social skills. No one's working with them on coping mechanisms. No one's helped them caught up, and now we enter, and now someone's holding them accountable to expectations, to homework, to learning, to how you behave, how you respond. How do you talk to an adult? How do you talk to a peer? How do you talk to someone when you're angry? They no longer have those skills because they weren't taught to them at an age where we could really make an impact. So those are the kids that are coming that all of a sudden like, hey kid, you gotta get your homework done, point. F off, B. That's what I'm told. And I step back and I say, okay. And we give them space. And I come back and say quietly, hey, you can do this. I know you can. You get flipped off, stormed out, because they haven't learned. And now, not only is the sixth grade homework and the work so far above them, that mountain that was once a hill feels like they can't climb it. So why try? What we need, you asked, what do we need? We need people. We need people to show up in our, our hallways, parents, volunteers in education to come and be with those kids, those kids who need a break and there's nowhere to go in our school because we don't have enough staff and enough resources for a place to send them to go. We need people there. It's not about money, it's about community. There is so much apathy to school right now in that 10 to 20% of my kids where they don't see the point they're just barely holding on, they're going off into the void, they're looking out and you know they're not actually there because what's the point right now? No one held them accountable before, so why now? There is so much apathy that I'm trying to instill in them that there can be a future, but they're only in sixth grade, they're 11 and 12 years old. That's a hard thing to think about, to comprehend and to understand. We need people, we need resources, and we need people to stand up for education. Because what's going on on those social media platforms, when our school district posts that we go to distance learning for two weeks, we get absolutely horrible comments from parents. And these are parents we know. So when their parents are talking about how horrible teachers are, what we're teaching, what we're expecting of them, what do you think they come to school? They're parents at 11 and 12 years old. They parent what they hear at home, they parent what they see. So if the parent doesn't care, if the parent is angry, and they've been making fun of teachers and making fun of their district, but their child is still coming into my classroom, what do you think that child is going to say and behave like? I love these kids. I'm not going anywhere. I love John Adams. It's an amazing school with wonderful children, and there is a bright future there. But yes, as Ben said, we're waiting for the dust to settle. And we're barely holding on as teachers. What we need is parents to answer that phone call. And rather than me say, hey, your kid was cursing me out today for me asking them to do their homework, and they say, well, they're your problem during the day. Figure it out. I need them to say, you know what? Sorry that happened. Let me talk to him tonight. I need that kid to come back the next day and maybe stand up for a consequence and say, hey, Mrs. Beatty, I'm sorry. And I would look at that kid and say, you know what? We all make mistakes. Welcome back. That's what we need. 
and it's not there right now because it's a community thing right now. We need more community standing up for us, standing up for our children, standing up for their futures. Dollars help, let's not lie. Money makes it go around in education, right Andy? But we still need people because it's the relationships with kids and with staff that will bring us through it. So I hope I answered all those questions that you kind of come. <laughs> She agrees. Sometimes I put my own students to sleep. <laughs> this is Clara, our youngest. Our other two are in Sunday school right now. I'm wondering if they're allowing volunteers back to They weren't for a long time, and that was part of the problem. That's also why we've lost a lot of our subs. Subs don't want to come anymore because of the language and the fights and subs are abused from where even the teachers are because they don't have those relationships. So we've lost a lot of amazing, really good subs that used to come for us. So I don't know, Andy? There, there are some um, back in the building, uh, but it's really limited. Um, Again, but, with COVID, I don't know. Yeah, we don't have many up. at JA. I don't mm -hmm. think any. Most of the time I end up giving up my prep to go sub for another teacher. Yeah, That's how we run it, at least at the middle school and high school, is we, we um, if a teacher is absent, their schedule goes into like an online booking, and then we each give up our prep time to go and cover that, that classroom um, when there's not a sub. I know at the elementary level, I believe it's your, your specialty teachers, like the reading specialists that might give up their entire day to go sub for a classroom yeah, because it's classroom-based. One it's, classroom teacher will, for the, like the second grade team, will absorb that class. Right. So now they've got additional students yeah. in there. But it's kind of how we have to cover. It's what we do for each other. Anybody want to go into education? <laughs> That's the sad thing. Because these are the people we need. Those that are really motivated. Do you want to be a teacher, Ben? Uh, <laughs> not right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, um, there's a really good, I just wanted to make sure that, that I put it out there, there's a really good uh, episode of uh, the podcast, This American Life. Um, it, it's the most, it was the most recent, I don't know how often they, uh, they drop, but um, it was, um, is, school, uh, is school as we knew it done? Um, and spoiler alert, the quick answer is no. Um, as, as Megan was just saying, uh, the relationship, uh, school is the most ancient thing we do. Um, the relationship between two human beings. And um, the notion that somehow, you know, we're going to put kids in, we're going to put any human being, it's, it's not about kids, it, the notion that we're going to put um, any human being, especially kids, in front of a screen and, and they're going to actually learn something is a basic confusion um, that I think we're all part of. Uh, the difference between, you know, smarts, I can look something up on my smartphone the difference between smarts and wisdom. Um, I, I'm shooting for the latter um, uh, in my work with kids. I'm shooting for, you know, what can I give them to do that? But um, I, I'd encourage you to give it a listen. Uh, I, think it, I think it paints a, a really interesting p uh, picture of, um, of the reality that we're, we're up against. And we're living, all of us, together. I um, I want to uh, do one say one more thing or have Ben say one more thing and then I think we need to stop. But um, this is one of the wisest people I know. I don't know how it happened, but he is one of the wisest people I know. It's on technology, twenty hours a day probably. Um, what what can you what what do you say about technology? Um, I feel like it's a blessing and a curse because there's so many things that can be done like extraordinarily well with technology but there's so many variables that could go so entirely wrong both at school at work uh even at your home you know and um going back to what tiffany said about violent video games is that like it that part i feel is like it should be more like brought to more attention so that parents can know because i don't feel like they should be like banned for everyone but it should be up to the parents you know, like the parents should, like, like monitor, yeah, monitor it, and like tell their kids, like, 
like just said it straight, like you can never do this in real life, you know? And just like really work hard to give them those social skills. Because even in the last two years, I have lost, like I've gotten such bad social anxiety. And this is the biggest group I've talked to in over two years. So <laughs> it's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, everyone kind of lost that, so it's all a struggle. Everyone's a little bit off, like tilted, and there's not really much you can do about it because it's nearly everyone. And I've heard stuff about AP students, like who, like when we were in like in person before the pandemic, like straight A's, like 4.0 GPAs. But now I have friends taking AP Physics and. The curve was so bad they scored a 58 on the test, but it was rounded to a 95. Everyone's, yeah, everyone's just like not doing good, and it's really hard to learn in situations like this. And I'm pretty sure that like everyone can agree on that. Yes, and that's smart. Hi, I'm gonna have to cut us off, but man, I these are three people just from our congregation. Two of them had no intention of speaking today. <laughs> so thank you, Tiffany, Megan. Thank you.